Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As organizing committee, we are grateful to welcome you to SA Details of Digital Hepatology Conduct Meeting 2022. This meeting is similar to arrangement, uh, arrangement we made last year. Attendees learn about the latest liver disease research being presented at ASLD 2021. Research being uh, done this connect meeting brought to life with case study based discussion about the diagnosis management of viral hepatitis, hepatitis B and C, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, alcoholic fatty liver disease, HCC, cirrhosis, and its complications. In this meeting, there is also a training workshop, which is connected between ASLT faculties and Turkish young physicians and investigators for doing research, meta-analyzing, reading scientific paper, getting data presentation. Because of the ongoing COVID pandemic, ASLT and TASL work together to offer TASL members in our joint asl TASL Digital Hepatology Connect meeting also registered for the Liver Meeting Digital Experience 2021, as like previously we did. As TASL, we will be grateful to partner with ASLD. On behalf of the TASL Governing Board, we want to thank to, to Laura Devi, the President of the ASLD, Ray Kim, my good friend, and also ASLD Governing Board members. There are 300 participants of this meeting, all GI fellows, residents, PhD, young investigator. And 45 presentations will already pre submit and eight of them will be present this afternoon. I want to thank the Ray Kim and Murat Akgildas for organizing this meeting. And also I thank the organizing secretary Genja Gençdal, Nergiz Ekman, Shenjan Ajar. I would like to thank the drug industry for having brought us together in the wonderful event to discuss the critical issue in hepatology. And also, finally, I would like to thank the Global Tourism as the organizing secretary of this meeting for their kind efforts. We welcome you to this meeting and looking forward to your great, kind participation. Thank you very much. Yeni Yelin Kutlu Olsen. Welcome to the fourth TASL ASLD Connect program. My name is Ray Kim. Stanford University. I have the privilege of organizing this event with uh, Ramazan Ilman, my good friend. Again, this is the fourth time and my experience, it's always something uh, that happens and it's usually uh, politicians in the US and here that do something that, that's on tours that make our meeting uh, to be a bit more challenging last year and this year it is this virus that uh, uh, prevents us from coming together and being able to interact with with each other in person but what's important is that we are all here today and we will be exchanging ideas and um, advancing the knowledge of hepatology for the benefit of our patients and our societies so thank you for being here this is also the second time that we are doing this reciprocal uh, uh, arrangement where uh, TASL members have come to uh, uh, the labor meeting um, and actively participate in the scientific exchange there uh, from the ASLD side. This has been a very mutually beneficial arrangement that we have uh, uh, put together. And I hope uh, the feeling is the same on the Turkish side that you enjoy coming to the liver meeting and the portal is still available and active. So if you are, have some presentations that you want to catch up on, uh, they are there for you available. Finally, I'd like to give a special welcome 
to the junior colleagues of us, and that is the participants of the research workshop, the fellows and junior faculty. Uh, uh, the research workshop is usually uh, the most exciting part of this uh, whole meeting, and that's because it is those young people who are the future of our societies, future of our science and practice of hepatology. So I hope today will turn out to be one of those events where uh, people get inspired and engaged and interested in advancing the knowledge in hepatology. So I look forward to interacting with you. So I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you all be in on video throughout the next two days. And again, I thank you very much and I welcome you here. Dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would thank I would like to thank you, ESLDN Puzzle Organizing Committee, for this meeting. Uh, welcome to HCC session. Uh, we have three uh, great speakers: um, Hashem El Sera uh, and Louis Loberts and uh, Levan Tohanai. Uh, we have three speech, uh, and uh, first. Uh, HCC State of the Arts, uh, and then highlights of the um, TLMDX, and then uh, HCC work workshop. Uh, uh, let's start, uh, please, Hashem al Sarah. Uh, My name is Hashem al Sarah, and uh, I have the pleasure of giving you an update on hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, my first slide shows just a color-coded um, map of the world showing the different incidence rates for liver cancer worldwide. I assume you want to look at Turkey, and as you can see, Turkey is uh, an intermediate area with an incidence between four to six per 100,000. Uh, the hottest areas, the highest areas are Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. This just gives you a cross-sectional view, but it doesn't tell you about the overall uh, incidence and burden. This slide is really important because it has a new message. And the new message here is the orange bars are going down. So the age-adjusted incidence rates for liver cancer worldwide is actually declining, both in men and women. But we're seeing more cases. So the count is high as shown uh, in the green and people are aging more. So while there are more people developing liver cancer, that numerator divided by the underlying population uh, is declining. So if you're an individual provider, you're seeing more cases. If you're a public health worker, you're probably happy that the incidence is declining. Why is it declining? Well, the main risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma worldwide is hepatitis B. Uh, there's a, a campaign in multiple countries, especially those with high HCC incidence, for uh, early uh, childhood universal vaccination for hepatitis B. Uh, this is the classic program from Taiwan and uh, showing that um, over the past 30 years or so, the incidence of HCC uh, has declined in the vaccinated uh, children, uh, adolescents, as well as young adults, thus providing really a very strong proof that vaccination uh, for an infectious disease can drop the rates of cancer. Um, when it comes to uh, those who are already have hepatitis B infection, uh, there are many risk factors that would determine who progresses to liver cancer or who doesn't. Uh, but really, for practical clinical epidemiology standpoint, uh, are the ones who are eligible to treatment identified 
and treated or not. So those who are on antiviral treatment with uh, adequate viral suppression uh, have been shown to have a considerable reduction in the risk of HCC compared to those who are not treated. So on one hand, you have lower incidence due to vaccination, and the other hand, lower risk of HCC due to treatment. When it comes to hepatitis C, uh, again, multiple risk factors. We spent decades, two at least, uh, figuring out the epidemiology of who develops cancer and who doesn't, but there comes the good news really the major determining factor of developing HCC and HCV is the receipt of treatment and the achievement of sustained virological response. Uh, once that's obtained, there's very little that remains that determines the risk of HCC, and the major remaining risk factor is cirrhosis. So on this slide, it shows the uh, risk of HCC following the successful achievement of SVR stratified by cirrhosis or no cirrhosis. The um, incidence rates of HCC are shown on the bottom x-axis. If you go to the right, all the red dots show the incidence of HCC among those with cirrhosis. Overall, it's 1.8 to 2% per year, much higher than what most guidelines recommend for uh, implementing or continuing HCC uh, surveillance. So on the hepatitis C, uh, there is a decline in the incidence related to screening of blood and blood products and decline in the risk of HCC related to treatment. So those two factors contribute to the declining global uh, age-adjusted incidence and mortality rates for HCC there is a new kid on the block, there is a new risk factor, and that is uh, the metabolic dysfunction. And one major manifestation of the metabolic dysfunction is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Some people now call it the metabolic dysfunction-related fatty liver disease. Uh, we've conducted a, an important study, retrospective cohort study, in half a million people with NAFLD, compared them to another half a million without NAFLD, and shown that NAFLD in general confers uh, an increase, uh, almost seven times increase in the risk of HCC, but that the absolute risk, the actual incidence on the y-axis is quite low. Yes, it's more elevated than normal people because normal people have very low risk of HCC, uh, but it is low. So it creates a problem. We've shifted from risk factors that are really not that common. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C are not very common risk factors, but they're very dangerous risk factors. So you see on the bottom, uh, they occupy a very small space, but their apex or peak goes way high because their HCC associated risk is high. We substituted that with risk factors that are very common. Obesity affects anywhere from quarter to a third of the population, depending on the place. NAFLD affects 10 to 15% of the general population. But the actual increase in HCC is low in those people. So that dilemma uh, leads us to risk stratification. And that's the new uh, term, if you will, in the context of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So in the context of NAFLD, uh, diabetes, older age, Latinos, at least in the U.S., and importantly, the presence of documented cirrhosis elevate the risk of HCC. Of all of those risk factors, only the presence of cirrhosis puts the risk of HCC at a range or at a value where HCC surveillance is indicated by most guidelines. Something that is not ready for prime time, but it just reinforces my notion about risk stratification, is using other risk factors other than clinical and demographic risk factors to perhaps stratify people into high risk and low risk. And one of those tools is polygenic risk scores that incorporates high risk and low risk variants from few genes that have been connected to the pathogenesis and progression of NAFLD, such as PNPLA3, TMS5, uh, SF2, um, uh, HSD17B13, etc. They're all listed on this slide. Uh, figuring out a polygenic risk score 
And in those with the higher polygenic risk score, there seems to be a 1.5 to 3 fold, depending on the study, increase in the risk of HCC. So stay tuned. That's where the field is moving, adding different domains into what has become a very large population of NAFLD to try to uh, identify the group at a risk of HCC. But for now, um, if they have established NAFLD cirrhosis, then HCC screening and surveillance is indicated. If they don't have established cirrhosis, then you really need a closer look performing um, uh, two tests that are concordant for the presence of advanced fibrosis slash cirrhosis. Uh, the tests preferably need to come from different groups of tests. So there are points of care tests like FIB4, for example, NAFLD scores. Uh, there are specialized tests that uh, you can order uh, you know, uh, commercially. And there are the non-invasive uh, imaging tests such as FibroScan and MR elastography. If you have two tests belonging to two groups concordant for advanced fibrosis, then one should consider screening with an ultrasound plus or minus alpha fetoprotein, knowing that visualization may not be adequate for uh, in an ultrasound, and in those cases, it needs to be substituted with a cross-sectional imaging such as CT or MRI. Um, so, which brings me to HCC surveillance. There hasn't been really much progress there. The recommendations remain that the target population are those with liver cirrhosis or very select groups of hepatitis B without cirrhosis, and those are men older than 40, uh, women older than 50, uh, those who have a family history of HCC. Uh, if you forget everything about what I said, uh, I go back to uh, the, the amount of risk. All of the recommendations for HCC surveillance are really based on cost effectiveness arguments. And the driver of the cost effectiveness is the magnitude of risk in the underlying group. So if any group, for whatever reason, cirrhosis, fatness, etc., have a risk of HCC that exceeds 1% per year, the odds are the that's HCC surveillance is cost effective. The tools remain ultrasound and alpha feeder protein. Neither is very good on its own. Both together are slightly highly comp uh, slightly complementary, um, and and these are the tools. So assuming you do that, you're likely to find nodules in a liver in a patient with cirrhosis. And I think uh, a part of the updates here is. Uh, this lingo, the LIRADS, uh, these are stating the diagnostic criteria for HCC in likelihood that ranges from a LIRAD 1, where the likelihood is very low, to LIRAD 5, where it's almost definitive for HCC. There's nothing magical about it. It's what radiologists tend to report, but sometimes sporadically and inconsistently, about the main features of a malignant nodule namely arterial phase hyperenhancement, delayed venous washout, enhancing capsule, and if you happen to perform the cross-sectional imaging over intervals of time and there is threshold growth. The more you accumulate of these criteria, the more you end up in the red square where the likelihood of HCC is high and the converse is also true. So in the ultimate classic pictures, you have all of the features. So here is an arterially enhancing lesion with a delayed venous washout. And if you scrutinize carefully, there is also a capsule. So that gives you three of the four criteria, puts you at a LIRADS 5. And in that picture, it's, it's almost definitive for HCC. So once you make that diagnosis of an HCC in a cirrhotic liver, comes the point of uh, classification and linkage to treatment. It's a complicated, large topic. There are many classifications available. The two commonly used are BS, uh, Barcelona cancer, uh, Barcelona clinic liver cancer staging uh, and the Hong Kong staging system. I'm putting one here just to put an example. Um, it classifies people based on simple things, size, uh, liver function and overall physical status. So on one extreme, very early stage, small, single, preserved liver function, good physical status. On the other extreme, um, 
not uh, resectable and staged and poor physical status. On the very early stage, the treatment is resection or ablation that may offer cure. Um, the early stage, it's the famous Milan criteria. If it's solitary and they're optimal surgical candidates, then surgery is recommended. If not, then transplant should be considered. Then you have this large heterogeneous group of an intermediate stage. It's multinodular, it's unresectable, it's preserved liver function, and classically chemoembolization is the recommended treatment. What I'm going to show is the advance in the treatment has happened in advanced stage, which is C, where there's portal invasion, extrahepatic spread, still preserved liver function, reasonable functional status. That's where systemic therapies have evolved massively and considerably over the past few years. And that's where they're also invading the space, if you will, of intermediate stage. So liver transplant, just to remind you, because it is the function of gastroenterologists and hepatologists and indeed all healthcare providers to try to find patients at this stage where curative treatment could be offered. So one lesion lower than uh, less than five centimeters, less than three lesions, none of which greater than three centimeters, transplanted under these criteria, the five-year survival exceeds 70% with low recurrence rate. The dropout, look at the last line here, of over 20% due to HCC progression while people are waiting for liver transplant because they're paucity of livers. So that leads us to a movement in the field, which is what I've shown you earlier about stages are not static. They could be dynamic. They could move worse to your right, where people are waiting and progressing, or you can implement certain treatments like ablation, chemoembolization, and downstage people from an intermediate stage to an early stage or even very early stage and have them become candidates for potentially curative therapy. And that is stage migration. But the concept here is unlike the natural history stage migration where things tend to get worse over time, there is now a push for getting things better over time with therapy. Uh, to, to provide for that. So downstaging for HCC, again, it's making patients outside Milan eligible for transplant. But you can take the same example and downstage for resection, for example. Uh, the criteria are mentioned, which is something exceeding the Milan, but not too outrageously outside that range. The most common downstaging treatment is TACE or RFA. There are no randomized trials to uh, guide you on which is done uh, which is better and which is more suitable. Successful downstaging has been reported depending on the study, the center, the underlying group from anywhere to from quarter to 90%. And after they're downstaged, they can actually earn the exception points that accelerates their trajectory towards transplant. For systemic therapies, 2007 when sorafenib protein kinase inhibitor, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, uh, was, was first uh, invented or d approved, uh, we waited 10 full years for the next medication to be approved, rigorafenib, which is a second-line treatment, or, and uh, uh, nivolumab, which is an immunotherapy in 2017. Fast forward to 2020, and it's obvious on the slide, multiple other medications have been approved most of which belong to the immunotherapy category. And I will expand a little bit on the atezolizumab and bevacizumab, um, which has become a recommended uh, first-line therapy uh, for HCC. Uh, so let's start with a traditional look. An approved first-line systemic therapies with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, serafinib, lenvatinib, uh, both are supported by large uh, randomized control trials, high quality, and meta-analysis of these trials. What is the indication? Unresectable HCC um, for, for both. Um, rather than showing studies for each, I'm going to show one that compares them head-to-head -head that led to the approval of lenvatinib based on a non-inferiority claim. You don't need to be a statistician here to figure out that for overall survival, that's what OS is, both lenvatinib and serafinib were virtually identical. 
uh, lenvatinib offered higher uh, progression-free survival, um, and, and these are the results that led to basically uh, lenvatinib being a first-line therapy in addition to surrender. An important thing that many times doesn't get mentioned in these talks is uh, the focus is almost always on what happens to the right-hand side of the slide. There's hepatitis B, hepatitis C, there's NAFLD, um, there's a, a lot of chronic liver injury, cell death, regeneration, proliferation, leading to genomic instability, and hence the development and progression of HCC. But there's also another story brewing there, which is an immune process in which processes both native to the liver as well as instigated by the tumor leads to an immune suppressive environment or milieu in the liver. That results in an increased expression of checkpoints, which in turn expedites uh, the growth and uh, the promotion of tumors. So taking advantage of this and exploiting that, uh, where immunotherapies came along. So the classic study that really is a, is a practice changing study is the I Am Brave uh, 150. Uh, it's testing a combination of atezolizumab plus bevacizumab versus serafinib. So this is head to head comparing it to what used to be the first line uh, treatment. It's a multicenter randomized open label, phase three, large, very well done, uh, it's important to see the criteria of patients involved or enrolled in this study. They are people with compensated liver disease, and they're people with good physical status. Uh, in other words, it's still important to conduct surveillance for early identification, even if you identify a tumor that is large, that is not amenable to resection <coughs> excuse me, or liver transplant, because the newer medications do not work well or haven't been even tested on people with decompensated liver disease and poor physical status. The co-primary endpoint here was overall survival as well as progression-free survival. The orange line is the combination. The green line is serafinib. Higher is better. Both overall survival and progression-free survival was significantly longer in the combination of atezo plus BEV compared to serafinib, and that led to a change in the frontline therapy recommendations. So first-line therapy recommendation is atezo plus bevacizumab um, as a first-line treatment for those with advanced HCC, child pew, class A, good physical status, those who do not have bleeding varices, and because there were uh, the side effect uh, noticed of bleeding varices during the trials, the recommendation is to uh, survey for varices and treat them before starting uh, atezolizumab. A re second recommendation is serafinib or lenvatinib may be still offered as a first-line therapy in those with contraindications to uh, atezo and or bev, uh, or people who don't tolerate it for whatever reason, or if the medications are not available. Um, there's now plethora of second line uh, options. Uh, I'm not going to review, there's no time to review each one of them. So I listed uh, the top five here. I listed the key trials that led to their approval and the little nuances that may guide you in determining which one to use. So for example, uh, cabozanitinib, um, it's in compensated liver disease, but those who don't tolerate serafinib. Uh, if you go straight to the bottom, rigorafinib is those who tolerated first line uh, uh, serafinib, but progressed on it. Um, uh, ra ramucirumab is among those who uh, have AFP greater than 400 nanograms per ml. That's the group that responded better, uh, etc. So all of this is, is complicated. Uh, no hepatologist, I think, carries that working knowledge of all of these aspects together. Certainly oncologists may not know about all of it together and not pathologists and not radiologists, etc. So the call here, uh, more than ever, because of the complexity of the diagnosis and the treatment, is to have multidisciplinary care um, to mitigate, reduce, uh, the underuse of curative treatment, 
to reduce therapeutic delays, uh, to improve the stage at diagnosis and hence the appropriateness of the treatment, and to improve and expedite treatment receipt. And studies have shown that this multidisciplinary care is actually not just a nice thing, but it is associated with longer survival. This is my last method of this talk. So in summary, uh, there are many things to talk about, but I chose to say um, that the epidemiology of HCC is changing. There's less HCV and HBV. There is more NAFLD and metabolic dysfunction in the prevention. Screening and treatment for HCV and HBV has been really effective and needs to continue. Screening and surveillance in patients with cirrhosis uh, is an important aspect, although it still needs a lot of improvement. Risk stratification is an evolving concept that you should hear more of as we see more and more NAFLD. The treatment paradigms are changing. Um, and I mentioned too, the concept of stage migration and downstaging and uh, the proliferation of systemic therapies uh, that seem to be quite effective for advanced HCC and now being tested for all sorts of indications uh, in combination with other therapies. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, next speaker is Lewis Roberts, uh, and he'll uh, present uh, hi uh, highlights of TLMM uh, Please, Lewis Roberts. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to present to you. My name is Lewis Roberts, and I'll be speaking on hepatobiliary malignancies. I have a few disclosures. This first study talks about the incidence threshold for routine surveillance and the opportunity to lower the threshold given advances in our understanding and appreciation of the risk of HCC in patients with hepatitis C cirrhosis who have achieved biological cure, as well as changes in the standards of what is considered a cost-effective surveillance modality by Dr. Chatwell and colleagues. So cost-effectiveness studies used for HEC incidence threshold calculation are old. In part, they did not consider lower competing risks in patients with hepatitis C virus who have been cured, and they did not include new and more comprehensive hepatocellular carcinoma treatment options. Further, they used old willingness to pay thresholds to determine if HEC screening was cost-effective or not. And with all of these changes in our practice, Dr. Chatwal and his colleagues made new calculations of the cost effectiveness. So he developed a micro simulation model of the national history of HCC in individuals with HCV and cirrhosis who achieved biological cure with oral direct acting antivirals and accounted for competing risk post-HCV cure, HCC tumor progression rates, real-world HCC surveillance adherence, and contemporary HCC treatment options and associated costs, as well as the utilities of different health states. With all of those, they came up with an updated HCC incidence threshold. The old HCC incidence threshold was at 1.5 per 100 person years or 1.5% per year. And that corresponded to an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of about $50,000 per quality adjusted life year with the new standard of $100,000 per quality adjusted life year. You can see that the new HCC incidence threshold is 0.4. What that translates to is that individuals who have HCV with cirrhosis who are treated, although we see some decrease 
decline in their risk for HCC, that is still above the threshold. And the general recommendation is that these individuals who have cirrhosis are cured of HCV should continue surveillance for HCC. So this study is an important update on HCC incidence threshold above which routine surveillance is cost effective in virologically cured hepatitis C individuals with cirrhosis. Moving on now to HCC surveillance in patients with hepatitis B virus infection, Dr. Grace Wong gave an excellent summary of this during the HBV Global Symposium, which was organized by the Global Outreach and Engagement Committee of ASLD. She reminded us that this benefit of surveillance programs has been documented in a number of different retrospective studies showing that individuals under surveillance who have their HCC diagnosed have longer survival than individuals who have HCC diagnosed when they are not under surveillance. A novel presentation from Dr. Wong's group was on machine learning models to predict HCC. So there have been a number of models that have been developed to predict HCC, uh, particularly in, the, in individuals with chronic hepatitis B. And Dr. Wong and her group developed an artificial intelligence-based machine learning model to predict predict HCC and compared this new model with the previously developed models. And um, what you can see here is that they used a number of different methods to develop the model and found that the ridge regression model in the second um, row had the best performance overall. When they compared this to a number of other scores, you can see how that the area under the receiver operating curve was quite a bit higher for this new risk score than for the previous risk scores, including the REACH and the PAGE and REAL risk scores and the CUHCC score as well. So this potentially could be beneficial in improving the cost effectiveness in HCC screening, because if these risk scores allow us to eliminate individuals who are at exceptionally low risk of HCC, then the resources can be diverted towards those individuals that are at higher risk and hopefully from an ov overall population basis our surveillance efforts can become more cost effective. Another point uh, that Dr. Wong made is that individuals with chronic hepatitis B virus infection who go on antiviral treatment have reductions in active hepatitis and inflammation and subsequently reductions in liver regeneration and reductions in the baseline AFP elevation. What this does is it makes AFP a more sensitive marker and specific marker also in this group of patients. And instead of the standard cutoff of 20, which achieves a sensitivity of 64% and specificity of 87% overall, we can see that in a cohort that they studied, reducing the cutoff to six led to a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 80%. So there's potentially some substantial benefit to be gained by reducing the cutoff in individuals who are on therapy. It seems as though ASLD 2021 though was the year of the biomarker and what we've learned is that there are many different biomarkers being developed for HCC. One of the biomarkers that Dr. Wong mentioned is based on plasma methylomic profiling. This was actually from a number of years ago and she mentioned that the technology that was used in this initial study was um, quite expensive at the time. And she spoke about um, the hope that these technologies might become less expensive. And as we will see in, the, in some of the next um, few slides, there are actually technologies that are, look like they will be coming to market with modifications of the epigenetic methylation-based biomarkers incorporated into those models. Next, we'll take a little bit of a detour into talking about chronic hepatitis B, but into the debate about entecavir versus tenofovir. And we've seen data from Asia primarily suggesting that tenofovir has advantages over entecavir as far as risk 
of HCC diagnosis while on therapy. And what this is, is a study from Professor Hashem El Sarag and his colleagues at Baylor College of Medicine. And what they did was a retrospective cohort study examining this. And what they found was a trend towards lower HCC risk developing in patients who were treated with TDF compared to entecovir. And you can see here data suggesting um, this trend, depending on whether these were unadjusted or, or adjusted, they barely reach statistical significance. This a study by Dr. Muhammad Ali looking at data from the Mayo Clinic, evaluating factors associated with outcomes of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma who were treated with liver resection. And this was a real world data analysis. Dr. Muhammad Ali investigates the effects of inflammatory markers, as well as nutritional markers on long-term outcomes. And the results here are that higher preoperative lymphocyte monocyte ratio was significantly associated with better overall survival. Lymphocyte monocyte ratios greater than 2.63 versus ratios less than or equal to 2.63 resulted in one year overall survival of 93.6 versus 79 percent, five year of 65.7 versus 36.6 percent, and 10 year of 42.4 versus 21.7. Similarly, a higher prognostic nutritional index was significantly associated with better overall survival. A nutritional index greater than 42 versus an index of less than or equal to 42 led to one year overall survival of 95.3% versus 76.5%, five year of 63.7 versus 39%, and 10 year of 43.5 versus 17.9%. In multivariable analysis, the lymphocyte monocyte ratio and child Pew score were significant prognostic features. These graphs show the effects of both the lymphocyte monocyte ratio and the nutritional index on patient survival. This carries through for overall survival and disease-free survival. For survival after recurrence, there was not a difference in the lymphocyte monocyte ratio graphs in the upper right graph, but the continue to be a difference for the prognostic nutritional index. So next, a few papers on epidemiology and chemo prevention. This first study is from Dr. Kalizao at the University of Southern California, and it's really interesting. Her group examined lifestyle factors and the association with the risk of hepatic cell carcinoma. They examined smoking status, alcohol consumption, diet quality, coffee drinking, physical activity, and body mass mass index and the association of these factors with HCC incidence and also calculated population attributable risks for the overall cohort, as well as stratified by race-adjusted BMI. Interestingly, what they found was that these modifying lifestyle factors can have a substantial impact on HCC burden across diverse populations, and coffee intake was the dominant factor in this population, with contributing to 44% of risk among lean participants. And so as far as lifestyle is concerned, they make the point that providers should incorporate diet and lifestyle counseling into HCC preventive strategies. And you can see here the data where for people with normal BMI, drinking less than two cups of coffee per day was associated with a higher risk of incident HCC. Presumably then the opposite, which is drinking two cups or more of coffee per day is protective, particularly for those with normal BMI. Next, statins. You know, there's been increasing evidence for the benefits of statins in not only hepatocellular carcinoma, but also cholangiocarcinoma. And this study from Dr. Beyao Zhao at Stanford University Medical Center examined the association between statin initiation and risk of HCC among patients with NAFLD. Their study provided strong evidence for the association between statin initiation and reduced risk of HCC development. NAFLD patients who used statins had a 70% reduction in hazard of developing HCC compared to non-users. And this here shows the hazard ratios unadjusted as well as adjusted um, as well, um, showing here uh, with 
the IPTW model, 47% uh, or 0.47% has that. So that's a 53% reduction in risk, even after adjustment and doing the inverse probability weighting. Next, following on in the discussion about NASH, is we see the association between longitudinal changes in markers of liver fibrosis and risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is the question, if, if you do serial monitoring of non-invasive tests for liver fibrosis, can that help with risk stratification? So if you do a fibro scan and you, you do another scan three years later, what happens if the initial fiber scan level is high and then it remains high because if it's low and it remains low or if it's low it goes to high or high goes to low. And the basic conclusion is that longitudinal measurements can be a cost effectively and easily implementable method for risk stratification of these patients because the reference, of course, is people who are low risk from the first test of cirrhosis and also low risk when tested at three years and using the FIP4 test, and that's the reference group. And if individuals are high risk FIP4 at the first test and, and high risk FIP4 at the second test, their adjusted hazard ratio was 48.6 fold. So you can see a substantial increased risk of HCC if people had high FIP4 risk and maintained this over three years. So we'll switch back to the biomarkers. I told you we would have discussions about biomarkers. And one of the biomarker models that is receiving a lot of use um, recently is the GALAD, which is a model based on gender age, AFP L3, AFP, and DCP or DES gamma carboxy prothrombin developed by Professor Philip Johnson and his colleagues. And these are two phase three biomarker studies that were performed in the United States. This first one reported by Dr. Jorge Marrero and colleagues in the, the hepatocellular carcinoma LE detection study. What they found was that GALAT substantially improved the detection of preclinical HCC six and 12 months prior to the actual diagnosis of HCC. And you can see six months prior to HCC diagnosis at a fixed specificity of 90%, GALAT had a sensitivity of 50% compared to 35% for AFP, 42% for AFP L3, and 39% for DCP. 12 months prior to HCC diagnosis, GALAT performed almost equivalently with a 49% sensitivity compared to 29% with AFP, 41% with AFP L3, and 33% with DCP. The second study that was reported by Professor El Sarag and his colleagues did not show as good performance. This was a study performed in a similar cohort of individuals receiving six monthly surveillance with liver imaging and AFP, and they calculated true positive rates and false positive rates for detecting any HCC or versus early HCC within six, 12, and 24 months of HCC diagnosis and compared them with individual biomarkers and the HES scores. What they found was that GALAD was associated with a considerable improvement in sensitivity for HCC detection, but they also found a considerable increase in false positive results over the individual or combined biomarkers. Therefore, the overall performance of GALAD was reportedly modest and not different from AFPL3 alone or HES. And you can see where the curves essentially overlie each other when you look at these different biomarkers. So clearly differences, perhaps these relate to underlying differences in the cohorts that are being studied, but something that will need further evaluation and discussion going forward. So moving back to the discussion earlier about new epigenetic methylation-based markers, this is a study that was reported by Dr. Amit Singhal and colleagues. The validation of a multi-target hepatocellular carcinoma blood test showing high sensitivity to detect early stage disease. This test combines patient-specific information from three methylation markers, HOX-A1, TSPYL5, and B3GALT6, 
the AFP and patient sex into a logistic regression algorithm to provide a qualitative result for the presence of HCC. This is a phase two case control study. And you can see here the test performance for early stage sensitivity was 82% for the multi-target HB test or HBT with overall sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 87%. This compares to AFP at a cutoff of 20 nanograms per mil, the sensitivity for early stage of 40, overall sensitivity of 58, and specificity of 100, and Gallard with an early stage sensitivity of 71, overall sensitivity of 81, and specificity of 93%. So more to come on that test. Um, another test is tissue and blood-based TGF beta pathway, functional biomarkers, and this is a proteomic analysis using the somalogic platform and we can see here evidence for differences between cirrhosis and HCC using this platform. And I'm sure there will be more to come on that new biomarker test. This next study talked about the incident and clinical characteristics of HCC associated with NAFLD without cirrhosis or advanced liver fibrosis. They stratified HCC by presence or absence of cirrhosis and by FIP4 index at the time of HCC diagnosis. And clinical characteristics of the HCC patients with and without cirrhosis and non-cirrhotic NAFLD patients with and without HCC were analyzed. Compared with patients with HCC and cirrhosis or high FIB4, HCC patients without cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis were more likely to be female, more likely to have a history of hyperlipidemia, and more likely to have better liver function test results. And this hints at differences in the underlying NASH HCC biology between individuals who have cirrhosis and then develop HCC versus those who develop HCC without cirrhosis. This um, shows you some of the data from that study. A couple of papers about pathogenesis, particularly related to the immune microenvironment, both in cholangiocarcinoma and in HCC. This initial one by Dr. Lollard and Dr. Elias, showing that tumor necrosis factor-related apoptosis inducing ligand or trail fosters myeloid-derived suppressor cell-mediated tumor immune evasion in cholangiocarcinoma. They were able to show that mice negative for trail had a significant reduction in cholangiocarcinoma tumor burden and myeloid-derived suppressor cell infiltration, suggesting that trail functions as an indirect direct T-cell checkpoint and augments the immune, immune suppressive effects of myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And this just shows that you know, they, they, they take um, the cells and if they put them in the trail knockout mice, the tumors do not grow as well and they see more cytotoxic T lymphocytes um, and fewer myeloid-derived suppressor cells in the tumor microenvironment. Another study showing markers of response to immune checkpoint therapy in HCC by Philip Haber and his colleagues. What they did was in 111 samples from patients who received immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy for advanced HCC and use whole genome expression data, mutational analysis of the beta catenin exon 3 and histological evaluation to try to identify signatures of response to immune checkpoint therapy. What they found was that in interferon signaling and MHC2-related genes were key molecular features of HCCs that respond to anti-PD-1 therapy. This needs validation, but is really interesting because it could point to how to select individuals that are most likely to respond to these newer therapies. Finally, Dr. Renu Denasekran and colleagues did a study. We know now that the combination of immunotherapy with against PDL1 and CTLA4 appears promising against advanced HCC and they use a transgenic mouse model of mic driven HCC to examine this combination using high dimensional mass cytometry or CYTOF to compare the immune responses. And in conclusion, they found that dual blockade of PDL1 and CTLA4 led to delayed tumor progression in an immunocompetent mouse model of aggressive HCCs. There was a distinct impact on the myeloid population with repolarization to a tumoricidal phenotype with increased expression of the ligands CD40 and MHC2, which play crucial roles in antigen presentation and activation of T cells. 
So these findings provide novel mechanistic insights on how the combination immunotherapy remodels the HTC microenvironment. Thanks very much. I hope this has been a good walk through the highlights of the Liver Meeting DX from 2021 and hope we can have a good discussion in the discussion time. Thanks very much. to thank the uh, organizing committee for the invitation. I'm going to talk about the uh, SIG of TASL, uh, the HGG working group, and uh, I'm going to talk about the recent workshop uh, we aim to uh, prepare a national guideline uh, with our working group. So uh, TASL uh, has uh, established uh, SIGs uh, four years ago and HGG uh, ACC Working Group uh, is uh, one of those SIGs. And recently we decided to prepare a national uh, guideline uh, to help the physicians who are dealing with HCC or who are dealing with the risky population uh, who is going to develop ACC. So we uh, did not target only gastroenterologists for this guideline, but uh, we targeted all, all parties who are dealing with HCC patients and also uh, who are dealing with risky populations uh, for HCC development. So uh, the working group, the workshop uh, experts uh, also consisted of uh, a multidisciplinary uh, team. Uh, all parties uh, were involved in this uh, expert group. And we had 65 experts from all over the country who deals with uh, HCC uh, patients. We uh, divided our experts into four groups and all group uh, worked on their topic uh, to provide the text. And we are uh, in the middle of this uh, process and uh, now we are going to share uh, the prepared text with the whole group and uh, hopefully we will finalize uh, the document uh, at the end of May or June. So these are the topics for the guideline. And uh, for each topic, we had experts, as I said, and they are going to uh, prepare a test and we will have uh, the final guideline uh, in, couple, uh, in uh, five or six months, as I said. And as it said, um, ACC is an important cancer worldwide. It's uh, the sixth cancer uh, when we look at the incidence, but it's the third when it comes to mortality. Uh, when we look at the Turkish uh, numbers, uh, at left side, you see the male cancers, and right side, you see the female cancers. Uh, we don't see liver cancer in the first 10 cancers. Uh, but when it comes to mortality, uh, the death, cancer deaths, uh, you see here the five common cancer deaths causes, and uh, the, uh, the sixth will, will be liver cancer if it does not uh, here uh, put in others category. 
uh, with around 4% of the cancer deaths. Liver cancer is the uh, sixth common cancer death cause in Turkey. So it's an important uh, cancer uh, for Turkish population because it's uh, in much cases it can be preventable or when you uh, it, you know the risky populations if you detect uh, cancer early uh, you have uh, curable uh, disease uh, in early stages especially so uh, turkey is uh, has an intermediate incidence uh, around 4.1 uh, for 100,000 population this is the adjusted incidence ratio for Turkey and uh, for mortality in the intermediate area as well. We don't have age adjusted uh, mortality, at least in open sources, uh, but the crude mortality rate is around uh, four for 100,000 uh, population. And in this slide, you see uh, the underlying liver disease, uh, which causes HCC. In North America and in Japan, uh, HCV is the uh, most common cause, also in West, Western Europe. But uh, in East Asia, in some parts of South America and Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in Turkey, HV, HBV is the main cause uh, for HCC. Uh, this is the preliminary data from uh, our SIG group. We are going to uh, submit it in uh, in a uh, week time, and uh, in our, according to our data, uh, it's uh, the main cause is HPV uh, in uh, our cohort as well, and. Uh, when we look at the data, uh, nearly half of the cases are diagnosed at a later stage. This is not a good thing, actually. So this is another study from uh, Turkey as well. When you look at the central uh, parts of Turkey, the numbers for HPV are the same. But when you go to southeast part of Turkey, uh, the uh, HPV cases in HCC cases is uh, up and there is a special delta uh, problem uh, in southeast uh, Turkey. And this is uh, the survival rates for different parts of the uh, world. And we don't have a precise uh, number for uh, Turkey. I mean, well, what's the expected survival uh, time of survival duration for a patient who is diagnosed with HCC. We don't know this exactly in Turkey, but we, I assume that it's around 12 and 24 months. Uh, but he, here you see in some countries, uh, the median survival is above five years. And this is well, partly because of uh, better uh, surveillance, better detection strategies. And uh, for these better uh, detection strategies, every country has uh, unique problems and every country has to have a unique plan uh, to have a better strategy to uh, detect at early stages and get better survival uh, rates. So. With, with this uh, guideline, with, with our working group, one of the, our main targets uh, is to have better survival rates in our country. So for uh, this, you have to detect earlier, you have to define risk populations precisely, you have to have a better surveillance strategies and better treatment strategies, especially for intermediate and advanced HCC, because if you can downstage uh, this group, uh, you will have creative options for these patients, and this will have, uh, may, make you have better survival rates. And um, also, you have to prevent, and uh, HCC is preventable, and you can eliminate the risk factors, and you can, uh, with this elimination, uh, HCC incidence will go down. 
Also, with this guideline, uh, our target is uh, utilize a best hepatology practice all around the country. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, uh, thanks to all the faculties and I, uh, I would like to thank again uh, to ASLD committee and all the faculties and all the participants and I hope and I wish uh, we can continue with this collaboration in the future and every year we can arrange this meeting. Now we will go on with uh, case presentations, then we will discuss uh, about the decision. Now, uh, firstly, uh, Professor Ermeji will present the case. Uh, uh, she is from Istanbul University, Istanbul uh, Medical School Department of Gastroenterology. Uh, please, Ermeji, microphone is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.
Sorry for the delay and uh, we apologize uh, because of the technical problems and uh, we will present the second case firstly uh, by uh, Professor Murat Harputoğlu from Union University Liver Transplant Institute, Department of Gastroenterology and Transplant Hepatology. Uh, Professor Harputoğlu, microphone is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody, uh, dear chairs, dear panelists, and dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, organizing committee, for this opportunity. Um, my case, uh, firstly, this is our Liver Transplant Institute. Uh, is, is the biggest transplant institute in the Turkey. Uh, my case, uh, 40 years male uh, from Iran. Uh, in his story, he admitted to another center with fatigue for a month, uh, nine centimeter mass in liver and thrombus in vena cava uh, detected uh, in his uh, examination. Uh, lesion uh, compa was compatible ACC as radiologic. Chest and brain tomography was normal and uh, bone scintigraphy was normal. Uh, he was referred to our center for transplantation after selective taste uh, in another center. Uh, first lab in our center, uh, <clears throat> hemoglobin value is normal, uh, only platelet value is, is slightly low, uh, AFP value is uh, very high, uh, uh, higher than 10,000. Uh, biochemical, biochemistry value uh, was normal except GGT, no comorbi uh, comorbidity, child uh, score was A, math score was 8. Uh, you can see in CT images uh, diffuse congestion uh, in the liver, uh, 9 centimeters ACC in uh, segment 7, uh, no filling observed in vena cava and hepatic veins. Uh, was compatibly uh, Bacchieri syndrome. Uh, you can see the uh, vessel images. And uh, we performed carography. Uh, and uh, a stent was placed in the vena cava inferior. Uh, in summary, 40 years, male, uh, Bacchieri, uh, vena cava inferior stent, 9 centimeter uh, ACC, AFP level is very high, uh, beyond Milan, uh, no an extrapatic <coughs> involvement, uh, platelet is uh, slightly low, uh, no uh, viruses uh, was present, acid was minimal, no splenomegaly, melt 8, and chart A. Uh, what is your suggestion? Professor Lewis, do you recommend uh, and do you... Uh, um, ...for presenting this case, which I would say is a challenging case, um, as we see, because this um, patient, unfortunately, has fairly extensive disease. And in addition to that, um, we, we, we're, we're talking in about biomarkers, the fact that they have a high alpha beta protein is also a negative prognostic feature. But having said that, I suppose the questions um, that I would have uh, relate to what alternatives there might be. And we were talking just, re just before about the importance of having a multidisciplinary approach, because I think the questions here would be, what are the available treatments um, for here a patient that we would characterize as having intermediate stage disease? They are beyond Milan criteria. They would typically not be considered a candidate for liver transplantation because of that. They would also, in, in most of our um, centers um, in North America, not be considered as a candidate for liver transplantation, in part because of their elevated alpha fetal protein, which is a predictor of uh, recurrence after liver transplantation as well. And so I think the question would be, 
is this patient potentially a candidate for local regional therapy of some kind? Uh, do they have sufficient hepatic reserve to tolerate a local regional therapy? Or should they preferentially receive systemic therapy, which in this case in our setting would be the combination of an anti-VEGF agent such as bevacizumab in combination with a check, an immune checkpoint inhibitor such as atezolizumab. So I think my, my, uh, my question, those would be my comments and my question would be, um, what are the available therapies for um, intermediate stage disease within um, the setting of your institute? Thank you very much, Professor. <clears throat> And I case. also want to ask the other uh, panelists, uh, is there uh, any recommendation or any uh, comments uh, at this stage on this patient about local regional treatments or uh, medical uh, treatments? Or do you think any curative uh, surgical uh, treatment or uh, about liver transplantation? Well, I'd like to say, say a couple of things. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I mean, this is a cirrhotic case, which is a huge uh, tumor over there. I mean, local regional therapy like resection or ablation, I mean, might not be the case uh, option for this patient because uh, the tumor mass is huge and it's a cirrhotic case, uh, like we discussed before. So I think, I mean, uh, for this case, uh, downstaging would be a good option like maybe using transarterial chemoembolization and maybe making it suitable for liver transplantation could be an option. And uh, it's beyond Milan and we know that the AFP is quite high and uh, the recurrence rate will be very high in this patient. So I think downstaging might be a good option for this patient and chemoembolization might be the, the thing that I will go with. No, that's excellent. And I, and I think when I say local regional, I actually think of the regional being so, so chemoembolization in my thinking would we would consider a local regional therapy, whereas I think we would we would consider ablation more of a local therapy. So we may just have a, a, a difference in terminology there, but, but I, I agree with it, with you completely. So when we discuss a case like this at our tumor board, our knee-jerk reflex has been to use embolization techniques, either taste, tear, you know, and, and we might actually combine it. Uh, we don't use tear, I have to admit, in my facility as much because we have excellent radiation oncology and tear is used in exceptionally rare cases. Um, is it is way too more cumbersome for these patients. So if we combine taste with uh, uh, either drug eluding beads or even plain, you know, we'll do the trick together with SBRT, that's a good option. And we used to do that a lot. But recently, especially with Atezobev, like Dr. Roberts just mentioned, entering our armamentarium with something like 30% response rates, this is changing the way we approach this. I think we are doing a patient as such with such high AFP, such huge tumor burden with IVC thrombosis. So, I, I really feel that we should give the systemic therapy a role, try to downstage with systemic therapy and then use our armamentarium, rich armamentarium of local ablative options. Uh, if you would have asked me a year and a half ago or so, I would have suggested directly going to taste, but now I am changing my approach to include systemic therapy upfront for a case like this. Do we have good data? Absolutely not. I have been searching clinical trials.gov as to what's coming, and I have to admit there is a lot of data coming, especially from Asia, pending multiple studies looking at these. Um, stepwise approaches 
to therapy. And I am heavily expecting some outcomes data on this, but that would be my team's current approach. Thank you, Professor Aitaman. Uh, because of the time, we should go on. Uh, what did you do, Professor Arputlolo? We can go on. Uh, the, our go. institute, uh, very experienced uh, institute, and uh, uh, we are performing uh, transarterial chemotherapies uh, successfully. And uh, 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 multidisciplinary tumor conceal, uh, we planted the taste uh, and uh, you can image the taste images. Uh, uh, after uh, one month after the taste, these images. And AFP level uh, decreases uh, 3,000. Uh, and uh, you can see the perfusion CT images. Arterial blood supply increases, AFP level uh, decreases to 3,000. Uh, in this stage, uh, I would like to uh, wonder your uh, approach, uh, transplantation or again, uh, downstaging tre treatment. So despite the taste, the alpha, prote alpha photoprotein level uh, higher than 1000. At this stage uh, from the panelist, uh, is there anybody recommends liver transplantation for this patient or going with systemic therapy? I think I would propose systemic therapy in this setting uh, most, most likely uh, because again, the AFP still remains high. And um, I think the other question of course is what happens to liver function, the underlying liver function in the context of the treatment, uh, because that's the other consideration is that we want to be careful um, that we don't affect liver function to the point where um, we actually are curtailing potential survival um, from um, other therapies. So I, I, would, I would recommend systemic therapy at this point. I have to agree with Dr. Roberts. Uh, we have uh, we get away a lot of the times, but we had quite a few patients where with repeated tests, we lost the golden window of uh, being able to intervene with systemic therapy. Okay, is there any different recommendation at this stage from the panelists? So we can go on, Professor Artolo, mm -hmm. please. Uh, and we plan second taste. Uh, you can image uh, after second taste images. And uh, we found uh, 10 millimeters, a new nodule in segment six, uh, probably regenerative nodule. Uh, now, uh, two lesions. We have two lesions. Uh, AFP level. Decrease it to 700. Uh, at this stage, uh, what is the perfusion CT and decreased arterial contrast enhancement? At this stage, and PET CT, no metastasis and mild hypermetabolic lesion of uh, 8 centimeters containing lipiodol was observed in liver segment 7. Uh, at this stage, uh, do you suggest the liver transplantation or not? Um, well, I personally, I mean, yeah, liver transplantation might might be handy in this patient, but uh, I think uh, going with maybe another uh, transarterial chemoembolization and maybe doing a, another local regional approach to the other lesion might be the second option. Uh, yeah, but liver transplantation is coming. I mean, uh, the the I mean, the level is going all the way down. We're downstaging the patient. I think third third chemoembolization might work for this patient. I agree. Seeing seeing the benefit here, and um, we, we've been we've been glossing over the liver. I, I, the liver tests go by very quickly, but it looks as though that we we are maintaining 
um, um, so, uh, acceptable liver function in this setting. So I think as long as we are maintaining acceptable um, liver function, um, this would be a reasonable approach. And of course, the other, I think, dimension here is what the wait time is for liver transplantation in your center. And um, is this a situation in which um, if the person were to decompensate, there would be the opportunity to transplant them with a relatively short wait time. I think that's a, a very important component of the decision making here in terms of, for example, is there a living donor, um, 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 a living donor transplantation option available where in that setting, you know that if we have the compensation, we can have fairly rapid um, a pivot to transplantation fairly quickly. And I think the response to taste, such rapid response to taste is going to be associated with less recurrence rate and better overall survival post-transplant also. We have data to suggest that. Okay, Murat, we can go on because time is very limited. Yes, uh, and uh, we planned living donor transplantation, uh, but uh, you know, uh, in our country, uh, cadaveric transplantation is very difficult. And uh, the patients found a live donor uh, three months later. Uh, but uh, three months later, we saw the uh, uh, patient AFP levels increased. Uh, 2000 uh, again. Uh, at this stage, uh, you can see the image and uh, you can see summary. Uh, three months later, uh, six centimeter ACC, no contrast enhancement, and one centimeter knee nodule, uh, uh, regenerative, regenerative nodule, and no metastasis. Uh, what's your suggestion now? Would you pass here because time is limited then okay. at the end of the okay. case we can... Uh, okay, we plan the tear and uh, you can see mates. You can see mates tear and pet uh, images. Uh, now, AFP level 250. Uh, and the LDLT was performed after uh, 14 months, uh, first uh, admission. You can see the images. And explant pathology well differentiated ACC tumor number two. Uh, one of them, 95% uh, fibrosis and one centimeter. Uh, viable tumor tissue and one centimeter no fibrotic, no, no micro and macrovascular invasion. Uh, two years after LDLT, no ACC recurrence and immunosuppressive regime. The uh, AFP level is very good. Thank you. Of liver function, this uh, allowed um, continued treatment and, um, in the end, very successful um, treatment for the patient. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much all. Thank you very much to the organizing committee for their kind invitation. Because of the limited time, I'll present my case who, and at the, we, can, we can make a discussion in the last, uh, after my presentation finished. Um, can I change the slide, please? Okay. Uh, our case is what, six years old male who lives in Istanbul and who, had, who was a taxi driver and who had two children. In 2010, he was diagnosed with HPV infection in the cirrhotic stage. After that, TDF treatment was started and our colleagues directed him to us for follow-up. In that time, in April 2011, his platelet count was 70,000, his INR was 1.3, his AST, LAT, 67, 45 respectively, bilirubin level was normal, albumin level was normal, and AFP level was 7. At this point, I want to remind the HP risk score, which calculates HCC risk, risk in who had hepatitis B on hepatitis B treatment. It consists of age, gender, and platelet counts. A five-year cumulative HCC incidence rates, according to HP score, if it's above 17, there is, the risk is approximately 17%. Uh, our patient's HP risk, risk score was 21, which shows us that if he has an increased risk for HCC. Uh, there are several kinds of uh, risk score uh, which predicts HCC risk in hepatitis B patients, such as REACH score, such as HB score, such as modified HB risk score. These scores consist of different parameters such as age, sex, platelets, underlying liver diseases. And when we look at his medical history, he had hepatitis B since 2010. He had inguinal hernia operation in 2005. His mother has diabetes. His father has diabetes and hypertension disease. No history of hepatitis B infection in family. Uh, he was not smoking uh, for three years. He was not uh, drinking alco alcohol. And he, he was uh, on TDF treatment for three years. And when we look at his physical examination, his cardiovascular examination was normal, respiratory examination was normal, both hands had pulmonary erythema, which reflects a uh, liver disease, and we detected dullness in percussion in trope area, which reflects splenomegaly. While we were checking, while, while we were screening for HCC with ultrasonography and AFP levels, we found a mass lesion in right lobe posterior segment of the liver, which was 4.3 centimeter which was heterogeneous hypoechoic lesion. When we look at the AFP level, it increased from 7 to 171. In that time, his INR was 1.3, his palatalate count was 42,000, uh, his albumin was 3.3, his bilirubin level was normal. At this stage, his mouth was 11, child blue score was 6, but we, we, never, we never observed a site of encephalopathy and varicell hemorrhage in our case but he had grade two esophageal versus. After the detection of mass lesion and ultrasonographic examination, we performed MRI imaging for the understand the nature of the lesion. As you can see here, MRI revealed, revealed five centimeter encapsulated mass showing hypervasculature on arterial phase and washout on venous phase. As you can see here, this is the T2 waiting sequence, and this is the T1, this is the washout as you can see here. We will have to perform lesion mass biopsy for the detection of HCC. Definitely no, because he had uh, LI right, right, right criteria which compatible with HCC. We didn't perform lesion biopsy for the diagnosis of our, of our case. And when we look at the BCLC staging system, BCLC combines all single nodules in stage A. Uh, no difference for the uh, lesion size if it's below five centimeter or it's above five centimeter. So our case was early stage HCC, which was which was five centimeter tumor in right segment of the liver. So we have our case has solitary nodule with with compatible HCC. If if it's optimal surgical candidate, he had grade two viruses, grade, grade two esophageal viruses. So we, we want to proceed with transplantation. We could proceed transplantation or ablation therapies. But in that stage, our patients has no live donor candidates. We listed him deceased donor transplantation list in that stage. Let's look at the BCLC classification system, which was updated. As you can see here, our patient has five centimeter HCC. It was a single nodule. Our patient has 
increased portal pressure so we could proceed with ablation or transplantation treatments. If these treatments were not feasible, you could proceed with taste or radiomobilization treatments. No live donor candidates for lab transplantation I mentioned before. So these are the treatment options for BCL cichlid class A, resection, transplantation, thermal ablation, or taste treatment. What did we do? We didn't think about resection because he had grade two as a phagalvarysis, which reflects as clinical significant portal hypertension. We could proceed rather frequent ablation therapies, which is curative, especially below three centimeter, below three centimeter lesions, HCC. But we didn't proceed with radiofrequency ablation therapies because of the location of the tumor. What did we do? We wanted to proceed with taste treatment. As you can see here, we performed taste treat treatment for three times because there was still viable tumor. There was still arterial enhancement in our patient. So we performed taste treatment for three times. After the third taste, as you can see here, in T2 weight uh, images, as you can see here, no hypo-intense hypo lesion. We couldn't see any lesion there. This is hypo, full hypo-intense. Hypo and there was no arterial enhancement. As you can see here, AFP level was decreased to 2 from 171 to 2 nanogram per milliliter. As you can see here, there's no decompensation or no liver abnormalities uh, with the taste treatment. Albumin level was 4.5, platelet count was 678, INR was 1.3, AFP was 2. As you can see here, this is a tumor science. After, before taste treatment, it was about five centimeter. After the third taste, it shrinked by two centimeter. This is the AFP level, co level course, our case, which, which was from 170 to two nanogram per milliliter. We wanted to check metastatic lesion. If he, our patient had metastatic lesion, we checked bone scintigraphy and thorax CT. There was no metastatic lesion in our case. So uh, in July 2015, there was a suitable cadaveric donor, uh, and he was still in Milan criteria. He had a cadaveric liver transplantation on July 2015. Uh, let's look at the pathological examination. Total hepatotomy material, early HCC, and common dysplastic nodules we detect. Cirrhotic liver consists of nodules HCC with a diameter of 1.3 centimeter in the cirrhotic liver, but I want to underline that HCC focus was all necrotic. Slight technical tuberculosis and stromal invasion in portal areas we detect. After six years, this is our patient, last outpatient visit. Uh, as you can see here, his physical examination was normal. His laboratory analyses were all normal. He is on Everilimus, Mycophenolatmopatil, and Tenofovir Alephanemid treatment. Let's look at the clinical course of course, our case. 2011, he diagnosed with HPV cirrhosis. We started TDF treatment. After the after third taste, after T trans taste uh, treatment, in July 2015, with liver transplantation, he had liver transplantation. And now, after the six years, he is all normal. His laboratory analysis, his physical examination were all normal. So he was the luckiest, one of the luckiest person who had transplanted in 2015, uh, as you can see here. So every clinic chooses, chooses its own way of treatment according to different parameters, such as experience level of the stuff, such as infrastructure, opportunities, patient history, and needs. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's an um, excellent presentation. And again, I, I think we see here the value of the combined modalities of therapy that we have available for these patients and, and also the um, value of um, a team approach, a multidisciplinary approach um, with careful um, selection of patients. And, and I think importantly, careful care of the patients um, to make sure that we are treating the two dimensions of their illness, both their underlying liver disease um, as well as the, the tumor that they have. Yeah, the mission of the taste, uh, sorry, I just want to underline that the, miss, the mission of the taste in that stage, in this case, it was in Milan criteria, but we were trying to protect upstaging here with taste treatment. It was still in Milan criteria for the first presentation. 
Dr. Uh, Roberts, I, I have a question for you. Um, what do you think about the timing of liver transplantation for these patients, especially hepatitis B patients? If they are on really good suppressive therapy, mm -hmm. they can do very well. Despite clinically significant portal hypertension, we can see that they do very well for a long time in terms of their underlying liver disease. So um, I have patients who had HCC 10 years ago, and we treated them and we are following them. Uh, are we rushing too fast to transplant where we have good ablative therapies? I mean, add to this case some SBRT and uh, you will have curative response in terms of the primary lesion. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, actually, TACE is not, is not a credible treatment, so we couldn't take the risk of metastasis for our case. So we wanted to proceed with uh, transplantation. As you can see here in the hepatoctoma material, there was an early HCC. So after that, we decided we, we think about this case uh, and we, we talk with my colleagues. We said that uh, this is the right decision for our case, which who has uh, HCC, early HCC in explanted material. Uh, Asla, did you give the system therapy such no, as no, often it for no, this patient? No, no, we didn't. Uh, what do you Rob, think about the... I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I wanted, I wanted to hear Dr. Roberts' comments, what they would do at Mayo in a case like this. I, I suspect that we would have done the same thing as, as was done here and, and proceeded with transplants. I think it's... It is, a, it is a really good question. It depends on, on, to some degree on, on the resources available. But in the setting here where this patient had transplantation available to them, I think we would have proceeded with transplant. Recognizing that in a setting where transplant is not available, some proportion of patients would actually do quite well. But there would be also other patients, you know, we know that um, patients um, who have chronic hepatitis B develop hepatitis B viral integration into their, into their liver genomes. So they, they remain at, at some risk of developing new hepatocellular carcinomas as well. We think that there's increasing evidence that the, the suppressive therapy with tenofovir actually reduces the rates of integration that we see in the liver. And so over time, the risk may drop for these patients. But I think um, compared, if, if they have liver transplantation available, the advantage of, of completely removing all of these um, viral integrations and giving people a new liver, I think, would, would supersede. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that if liver transplantation is not available, it's very reasonable to be aggressive because the suppressive therapy can be quite helpful. And uh, from the participants, participants from uh, Professor Fatih Beşik uh, ask about the uh, tear in your daily clinical practice uh, and about from these two cases, uh, when you compare taste and tear, uh, what's your daily practice? Uh, which one do you prefer to perform in your daily practice? We, we have, uh, within the liver transplant practice, we have a very established process of using TACE. And in fact, um, increasingly, our interventional radi radiologists are using hepatic artery embolization without chemotherapy um, because they, they find that the primary benefit probably is, is from the embolization therapy. Having said that, there are situations in which because of location, and if there's a lesion where we do an angiogram and we find that there is, you know, a very limited blood supply to the lesion, so that we can completely treat the lesion without high risk of injury to um, neighboring parts of the liver. And then, uh, within the context of sometimes having very very long wait times for patients we will prefer tear. 
um, because um, it seems in general, if you can deliver a really high dose, what they sometimes call segmentectomy um, to, to a section of the liver, you can actually achieve very effective treatment um, and, and perhaps more effective treatment than typically from, from TAKES. But all of this is within the context of being sure that we can preserve liver function to the to the anticipated for the anticipated duration to transplant and, and so it is often a balance between making sure that we don't induce with a very effective tear um, the development of liver failure and not and then be in a situation where we don't have a path to to transplant for that patient. Dr. Achilles, I have a quick question. Can I ask? Please, Professor Edelman. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much. I recognize the two different centers that the available treatment for the ACC patient. Is there any purpose? I mean, the what would the panelists say that the start the available treatment all ACC patients who underwent liver transplantation? Hmm. Icar, for example. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we use Everlimus for all ACC patients who uh, underwent uh, liver transplantation after one month later. Lewis, Aisha? We also. Yeah. We are also doing that. I think it's, I would say it's common. I don't know whether it's completely um, uniformly the case. Um, I think a lot has to do with the perception of risk of recurrence. So if for patients who fall completely within, within Milan, have a low AFP, their risk of recurrence is actually quite low. And um, I, I think our program would not necessarily put them on Everolimus after um, transplant. But anything that suggests um, a higher risk, um, I think would, there would be preference for using Everolimus long-term. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should finish this session because of the time and thank all the presenters and all the panelists uh, and uh, from the ASLD faculties, uh, Professor Lewis and Aisha Aitaman and uh, all the TASL members. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this session, Professor Edelman. Yes, I would like to thank also the all speakers, moderators, and the panelists, uh, and also participants. And Akarsu? And, uh, and uh, all audience. Uh, we'll thank all audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.